In mathematics, many statements concern themselves with how certain objects can be decomposed into smaller ones. For illustrative purposes, we usually use 2D and 3D examples and, moreover, often food items, since they lend themselves quite nicely to being cut. But cutting can mean a dozen different things in math, and so a theorem on cutting pizza might be about something entirely different than a theorem on cutting pancakes, despite both being flat circles. I'm Bernhard Werner, this is Summon Product, and in today's video we talk about five different ways mathematicians cut food and five different interpretations of what cutting even means. As a small disclaimer, for most statements hereafter, I won't go into full detail when presenting a proof, I will only try to convey the core idea behind them. Let's start with a sandwich, concretely a ham sandwich. Two pieces of bread and a single slice of ham. Tasty. The so-called ham sandwich theorem states that we can cut it with a single straight cut such that all three parts are perfectly split in half. If the sandwich is built from symmetric objects, stacked neatly like on screen, that's fairly obvious. But it also works if the parts are weird shapes drifting independently in space. We can still find a single plane that cuts each component in half. As long as the three parts are measurable. Measurable is a special mathematical term, which basically means that we can actually calculate the volume of the shape. There are very weird measurable sets, but for this video you can imagine any ordinary 3D shape you encounter in day to day life. The ham sandwich theorem in this general version goes like this. If you have n measurable sets in n dimensional space, there always exists a hyperplane, which is a n minus 1 dimensional flat subspace such that half of each object is on one side of the hyperplane. In 3D we already saw that. We can cut three objects in half with a plane. In 2D it means we can cut two objects in half with a single line. And in 1D it means that we can cut a single object in half with a single point. And if we go to higher dimensions it still works. In 4D, for example, we can cut four shapes in half with a single three-dimensional cut. But since that's cumbersome to display on screen, Let's go down to 2D again to think about why this works. Here we have two shapes and a potential cut. If we move the cutting line up and down and look at the shape on the left, we see that a different portion of it will lie above the line. This amount depends continuously on the height of the line. That means if we move the line just a tiny little bit, the area of shape A above it will also only change a tiny little bit. For such a quantity that depends continuously on something else, we can use the intermediate value theorem. It states that if we have a continuous function from the real numbers to the real numbers and the function takes two different values, it must also take all values in between. For our shape cutting, the area of shape A above the line is zero at some point, 100% at another point and therefore must also be 50% at least once. Moreover, this is true for all angles at which we can hold the knife. No matter how much we rotate the line, we can always add a parallel shift at the end such that shape A is perfectly cut in half. Now we start with a random 50-50 cut through A and look at how much of shape B is above the line. If you rotate the line around a point and make the correction for shape A, the area of shape B will depend continuously on the rotation angle. It's a bit fiddly to write that down precisely, but the idea is that rotating by a small angle will also only need a small parallel correction for A and hence the area of shape B will also only change a little bit. With this we can invoke the intermediate value theorem once more and being guaranteed an angle at which B is split into two equal parts. And since we always corrected the alignment of the line with respect to A, both objects are now correctly bisected. This same idea carries over to higher dimensions. In n-dimensional space the cutting hyperplane has n degrees of freedom. We can tilt it in n-1 directions and then shift it parallel in one direction. We can then fiddle around with these n dials to position the hyperplane to cut n objects in half. Instead of using the intermediate value theorem several times, there's something called the borsuk ulam theorem, which allows us to adjust all n parameters at the same time. But the idea is the same. Moreover, the theorem doesn't hold just for the volume of the objects. There are other types of measures one could use, for example, the number of points. In our world of food metaphors, a version with this type of measure would be if you have a pile of salt and a pile of ground pepper on a plate, you can split both of them in half such that both halves have the same number of salt and pepper grains. Back to solids, as mentioned at the start of the section, 
This works as long as we can calculate the volume of our shapes, which was called being measurable. We can cut objects into non-measurable sets, but then the notion of volume goes out the window. Let's look at an example for that next. If you take a pumpkin and you want to carve it for Halloween, you have to be very careful. Not only if your knife is too dull, but also with a few wrong cuts, you might end up with two pumpkins, both the size of the original one. Or more precise, if you take a sphere in 3D, you can cut it into six parts, which you can assemble into two spheres, just as large as the original one. This is known as the Banach-Tarski theorem. The whole pumpkin thing, however, is a reference to this XKCD comic. The Banach here in the theorem is Stefan Banach. He is also one of the first who wrote about the ham sandwich theorem we just looked at, but here we see that it's really hit and miss when it comes to him preparing food. The problem here is that these six pieces we get are not all measurable. They don't have a sensible notion of volume, and therefore they can be arranged in this weird volume distorting way. You still find it dubious that somehow the number of points increases when going from one pumpkin to two, but the number of points in a shape is usually an inadequate way to describe the shape once the amount reaches infinity. There are many examples and flavors in which this becomes weird, here's the probably simplest one. Place one point on the number line for every natural number. We can split this in two based on whether they sit at an even or odd number. After scaling everything down by a factor of two, you get two copies of the original string of points. Since we have a discrete set of points that are neatly numbered, it's easy to give a procedure on how to split them in two. To find such a function for an arbitrary set can be a huge pain in the butt though. For our pumpkin, or spheres to keep it simple, I will just show you the basic idea. We take a point P on the sphere and apply two different transformations. A rotation around the x-axis by an angle alpha, which we will call R, and a rotation around the y-axis by alpha, which we call S. There are many possible options for alpha. The most famous one is probably Arcus cosine of one third, used by Stan Wagen in his book on this topic, but I've seen Arcus cosine of three fifths quite often too, which I used for the example on screen. The important point is that these two transformations then form a so-called free group on two generators. For us, this means that applying these transformations and their inverses R prime and S prime in an arbitrary order will never create two different ways to reach the same point from our starting point. Every combination of those four symbols, R, R prime, S, S prime, gives a unique address for a point we created from our starting point P, at least as long as a rotation isn't directly followed by its inverse. In particular, we must have infinitely many points created this way. I will only show a few on screen, of course. Moreover, the sequence of transformations we applied to achieve this will all end with either R, S, R prime or S prime. We can split all generated points into four different categories based on what this last transformation in the sequence is. I use different colors and symbols for each point based on that category, just to give a sense of how chaotically they are distributed. The exact positions on the sphere are not important though. Taking the ones which end in R, we can cut off this last R and realize that we get all of the original sequences back, except the ones that ended in R prime. But cutting off R is the same as applying its inverse, R prime. That means we can transform a quarter of our constructed points into three quarters of all points by simply rotating them. And this is the main idea. We can quote unquote increase the number of points via rotations, which only works as we have infinitely many of them. And we can do similar things with all four different types of points defined by the last transformation that produced them. From here on out, it gets much more complicated though. First of all, we have to do this whole construction not just for one starting point, but for infinitely many, which I definitely won't show. But even then, we won't be able to cover all points of the sphere with this. If you take, for example, a point on the x-axis and rotate it by r, it will stay fixed. That means we can never use it, since any address created from the r's and s's won't be unique. We can add arbitrarily many copies of r, and therefore won't be able to identify it with a unique sequence of rotations. There are infinitely many of such exceptional points, which we have to take care of too. One has to be very careful about how to actually rotate and reassemble these six subsets for them to line up properly to form two new spheres. 
But since this section on what now is basically pumpkin mush is already long enough, I will refer you to an excellent technical write-up by Katie Buchhorn on this proof. If you want something to watch, there's also a video by Vsauce on this topic. It even starts by cutting chocolate in a way that produces an infinite amount of chocolate, so it fits right in with our theme here. As a takeaway, splitting objects into subsets can be done in various wild ways. And therefore the question, how can an object be cut into pieces, must be formalized carefully to give meaningful results. In particular, the notion of volume and area might not make sense anymore, depending on how you pick and choose points. Now let's continue with a cutting problem, where the areas in question actually exist. Imagine you want to share a pizza with a friend. Of course we assume that a pizza is a perfect circle, and that neither of you has a preference for the toppings. Let's also assume that you have a very particular skill set. You can make perfectly straight cuts at precise 45 degree angles. You can let all cuts meet in a central point, but you cannot by all the gods hit the center of the pizza. If you think that this is quite odd, then yes, it is. But just imagine you're using one of these weird multi-plate pizza cutters. Then the only human input is where to place the center. In any case, you have cut the pizza into eight pieces, each at a nice 45 degree angle, but you miss the center. How do you and your friend share the pieces to make sure that you both get the same amount of pizza? Here the solution is as simple as it gets. Both you and your friend will alternate taking pieces going around the cutting center. Then both of you get the same amount of pizza. Or more formally, when a circle is divided into eight pieces like here, these two sets of alternating pieces have the same total area. The proof for this you will most often see is this one. We subdivide our eight pieces more and then match the smaller pieces to congruent parts in the other half to see that everything fits together. This is one of many so-called proofs without words. I'm not particularly fond of this one here though. The construction itself is fine. You start by mirroring the small pieces in the bottom left to the opposite side of the pizza and go from there. But it's not immediately obvious, at least to me, why this is a good idea to begin with. And explaining it wouldn't give you a proof without words. Moreover, it is not immediately clear how this proof would generalize. The actual statement in the so-called pizza theorem is that the sets of alternating pieces result in the same amount of pizza if the total number of pieces is a multiple of 4, that's at least 8. So it wouldn't work for something like 4, 6 or 10 pieces, but it does for 8, 12, 16, etc. Concretely, if you have 4 n pieces and n people taking a piece in turn for n at least 2, they will end with 4 pieces each that have the same total area as the other quadruples. To prove this, we start with what seems pretty straightforward. We try to calculate the area of each piece. And then we could simply compare. To do so, let's assume that our whole pizza is a circle of radius capital R and that the cutting center is called C. Each piece is then described by two rays starting at C, one at angle alpha, one at angle beta. Since the cutting center isn't at the center of the pizza, the distance of a point on the circle to C changes depending on which direction we look. Let R of theta be this distance at an angle of theta. If you look at a very thin slice at angle theta, created by turning a very small angle d theta, we can model it as a right angled triangle. The base is r of theta and the height is r of theta times d theta. The latter is true because this is how angles are defined, as the length of the covered circular arc of the unit circle. And in this limit case of making the slice very thin, the circular arc and the height of the triangle become the same. Together we get the area of the very thin slice as 1 half times r of theta squared times d theta. To get the area of the whole piece, we calculate the integral for the limit of d theta going to zero. If you try to solve this integral, or rather ask Wolfram alpha, you'll find that it cannot be solved explicitly with elementary functions. It is a so-called elliptic integral. The name stems from the fact that integrals like these pop up when you try to calculate the circumference of an ellipse. There are some well-known approximation techniques for them, but as I mentioned, you can't actually solve them. We, however, don't necessarily want to calculate the exact area of a single off-center piece of pizza. We want to show that the four pieces a person gets together have the same area as the share of the other people. Since we created them by equiangular cuts, the angles only differ from each other by 90 degrees. 
that means the total area of pizza a single person gets is this integral. The trick now is that we can show that the function under the integral is constant. Concretely, it's 4r squared. We can pull this constant out of the integral and solve it to get the appropriate ratio of the full area of the pizza, which is what we expect if n people share a pizza circle of radius r and everyone gets the same overall amount. All that's left to do is to prove that the sum of these four radii really is constant. The paper by Jeremy, Michael, Jeremy, Andrew and Philip Hirschhorn on the pizza theorem does this particularly elegantly. I think. They are referring to a couple of figures which aren't present in the version of the paper that can be found online. My best guess is that they only exist in the published version of the paper in the Gazette of the Australian Mathematical Society. A similar argument is made by Martin von Gagan on a mass stack exchange post. He's starting with an explicit formula for r of theta, then he follows with some algebraic manipulations that are a bit more complex than the ones by the Hirschhorns, but they are easier to follow, I think, as they don't refer to non-existing diagrams. I will leave links to both the paper and the mass stack exchange post in the description. If we take this last bit as a fact now, this means that there's a better way to formulate the pizza theorem. If you place a point in a circle and draw a cross through it, the sum of the squares of the lengths of the four line segments is constant, namely four times the radius squared. And only as a corollary we get, firstly, that the four wedges created by rotating the cross have constant area, and secondly, the original pizza theorem if those wedges have the right size to tile the whole circle. Before moving to the next topic, I want to mention that there are many more variants and additional statements about this way of cutting a pizza. For example, sharing a pizza this way not only gives each person the same area slash total amount of pizza, but also the same circumference slash amount of crust. And it does in fact also work for multiples of 2 that aren't multiples of 4, but only if the center of the pizza lies on one of the cuts. These statements and more can be found in the paper by Mabri and Diamond, also linked below. In the last section, we looked at a particular cutting pattern through a circle in the areas of the resulting pieces. Instead of caring about the areas, however, we could simply try to create as many pieces as possible with straight cuts, regardless of their size. And for reasons, it's usually done with pancakes instead of pizzas. But for us here, it's still a circle. Obviously, the maximal number of pieces we get depends on the number of cuts used. So let's start with one. We get two pieces, a solid start. With a second cut, we get four, as long as we make sure we intersect the first cut somewhere within our pancake circle. With the third cut, we have to be careful too. Placing it somewhere through the middle gives us seven pieces, unless we hit the intersection point of the first two cuts. Playing around with this quickly makes it clear that avoiding any intersection of previous cuts is the main thing to pay attention to, as that would reduce the number of possible pieces. But it might not be immediately clear how to actually maximize the number of pieces. So let's go through the logic together. If we imagine every cut to be extended beyond the circle, it's just a straight line. Any new cut will therefore intersect any old one somewhere. But only if this intersection is within the circle, it guarantees that the piece in front of the old cut and the piece behind the old cut will be affected by the new cut. And by affected, I mean split into two. That means if the nth cut intersects all previous n-1 cuts, it must have run through exactly n pieces, creating n new pieces in total. And it obviously cannot hit more than every single previous cut. If we find a way to place the nth cut such that it really does intersect all previous ones, our number of pieces increases by n every time. And we can't do better. In math notation, let p of n be the maximal number of pieces after n straight cuts through the circle. We now claim that p of n is p of n minus 1 plus n. We already saw the beginning of the sequence for n equal 1, 2 or 3 cuts. We got 2, 4 and 7 pieces respectively. So for these it checks out. Let's take that as the start of an induction argument. Assume that we have already placed n minus 1 cuts such that each cut intersects every other one inside the circle. Then we look at one of them. 
it has n minus 2 intersections on it. Take any point on this line segment that lies inside the circle and isn't one of those n minus 2 intersection points. Create a copy of the line segment and rotate it around this newly placed point. Firstly, we want to ensure that this new cut doesn't run through any of the old intersection points. This is easy to fulfill as there are only finitely many points to avoid and we have a whole spectrum of angles to choose from. Secondly, the intersections of the new line with the old ones need to be within the circle. This can be fulfilled since the inside of a circle is an open set. That means if we only rotate by a small enough angle, the intersection points on the new line will be arbitrarily close to the ones on the old line we started from and will eventually lie within the border of the circle. By construction, this new cut meets every old one within the circle. The rotation center is the intersection with the line we started from and the others are what's guaranteed by the two conditions we just looked at. And there you go, starting with p of 1 equals 2, we get n new pieces with cut number n. One question that's left to answer, is there an explicit formula for p of n? And yes there is. Since we basically just sum up all numbers from 1 to n, each sum and representing a new cut, we get the well-known formula of n times n plus 1 over 2. Except when you compare that to our sequence of pancake numbers, you see that we need to add 1. Summing up the numbers from 1 to n gives you the triangle numbers. I'm unsure whether our pancake numbers have anything intuitive to do with triangle numbers, except that they have the same recursion rule and differ by 1, but if you know or see any connection, please let me know in the comments. More often, however, you will see this in the form of the sum of three binomial coefficients. I guess because then it's easier to see where you can find the sequence in Pascal's triangle or Bernoulli's triangle. Also, it looks pretty. Speaking of finding the sequence, if you are searching for information on this online, you will find it under the name Lazy Caterer Sequence. Apparently, a lazy caterer might cut a pancake this way if they are only interested in having many pieces to serve. But firstly, that's very rude towards caterers, and secondly, why would anyone cut pancakes before serving them in the first place? I usually call it the pancake sequence. Moreover, it fits the three-dimensional case known as the cake numbers, the number of pieces of cake cut by n two-dimensional planes. It is given by this formula here, which is another reason why the similar version for pancake numbers is nice to use. I will leave the proof of this formula here as a homework for you. We will, however, stay on the topic of cake. In all the above cases, we discuss procedures that are all hard or even impossible to do in practice. Moreover, cutting and sharing food in real life often has additional constraints. Maybe someone has a preference for one pizza topping over another, or the other way around, an intolerance for a certain part of the dish. With this, we enter the area of game theory, and there are whole books about what is and isn't possible to share based on the concrete scenario. Here, to finish this video, I just want to give a glimpse into how such real-life distributions could look. Most of them are described with cake and that's what we will use as our example too. But since it really isn't important whether the cake is two or three dimensional, we will stick with this rectangle here as our object to cut and share. To start, assume we have two people, Alice and Bob, who want to share this cake. You might have seen the solution or even have come up with it yourself. One person cuts the cake and the other chooses a piece, leaving the second piece for the person who cut. This creates a so-called envy-free or fair distribution of the cake. The nice thing is that we do not really have to properly define what envy-free is or what Alice or Bob would consider fair. For any reasonable interpretation of these terms, it does check out. Bob picked a piece, so he must be happy with the outcome. And Alice must have made the initial cut in a way that she would be satisfied with either piece. Fair. Now imagine a third person, Charlie, is involved. How to share the cake then? I will show you two solutions to this problem, but pause here and think about it for yourself a bit. How would you fairly split cake between the three people? The first method I want to show you was published by Dubbins and Spanier in 1961. You get yourself an impartial fourth person who will slide a knife along the cake. If one of our three people is satisfied with whatever is to the left of the knife, they say stop and receive the indicated piece. We continue until everyone has a piece. This must be fair since the person who said stop got the piece they wanted and everyone who didn't say stop thought that they can get something equal or better from the rest. The nice thing about this 
is that we can easily generalize to n people and then we only need n minus 1 cuts. Moreover, everyone gets a single connected piece of cake. The drawback, of course, is that we need an additional person to make the cuts. Let me show you how we can do without the extra person by allowing for more cuts and pieces. We start with a similar sentiment as in the two-player scenario. We let one person, say Alice, cut the cake into three pieces, such that she would be satisfied with any of them. Next, we ask Bob and Charlie which piece they would choose. If they point to different pieces, everything's fine and we can distribute the cake. We could skip this step, but it makes sense in practice. Let's assume, however, that they prefer the same piece. Bob now gets the task of cutting away a bit from his favorite piece, such that it is, in his eyes, the same as his second favorite piece, which we assume is the middle one. For now, we put the trimming he cut off aside and ignore it. Note that we cannot be sure that the piece he trimmed is still equal to the others in Alice's eyes, but she still has two pieces left she considers equal. Now we let Charlie take a piece. If we go through it case by case, we see that regardless of which piece they pick, the others can also get a piece they are satisfied with. Alice likes the two pieces on the left, Bob the two pieces on the right. We can always allocate these three big pieces fairly according to these preferences and Charlie's pick. For now, we will use this case here where Charlie took the trimmed piece. Bob has a piece that's equal to Charlie's based on how he himself cut the trimming and Alice has one of the initial ones she cut herself. We still have to divide the trimming now and the key insight is to think about Alice's opinion on the matter. Someone got the trimmed piece, in our example Charlie. Even if they got the whole trimming, they can't get more than Alice has from the way Alice made the initial cut. So if we divide the trimming in any way, Alice won't mind if Charlie chooses before her in this next round. Moreover, just as we had at the beginning, the person who is doing the cutting doesn't mind if they go last, since they made sure that they are content with every piece. From these two observations we can infer who has to cut next and in which order everyone picks. We let the person who got an untrimmed piece but who wasn't the first cutter Alice cut next. In our case, that's Bob. He cuts the trimming into three pieces he equally likes. Then we let the person with the trimmed piece, Charlie, select first, then the initial cutter Alice, then the second cutter Bob. In our example, Charlie got to choose first in every round, so they are definitely happy. For Alice, we made the main argument already, Charlie can't catch up to her first round piece, even with the additional piece from the second round. And in her eyes, her first round piece and Bob's first round piece are equal. Since she got to pick before Bob in round 2, she's happy too. And Bob? Bob got one of the two top pieces in round 1, which he guaranteed himself with the way he trimmed. And in round 2, he created three equal pieces, at least in his view. He also has to be satisfied. Any other outcome from round 1 will lead to a similar chain of arguments if we let the person who got an untrimmed piece but didn't cut in round 1, cut in round 2 and subsequently choose last in round 2 and the person with the trimmed piece from round 1 starts to choose in round 2. This procedure for three pieces was discovered by both John Selfridge and John Conway and neither of them published it, if I understand the history correctly, but it's now named after both of them. A generalization of it for an arbitrary number of people was published in 2016 by Assis and Mackenzie. It basically boils down to iterating this procedure and creating smaller and smaller trimmings. For n people it turns out you can achieve a fair division in n to the 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 n cuts. We have seen that we can use different procedures depending on whether we want as few cuts and individual pieces as possible or whether we have someone who can help out. And as I insinuated at the beginning of the section, there are plenty more ways depending on additional constraints you might have. For now, however, let's wrap this video up. In the five examples we saw, we encountered different interpretations of cutting. For the ham sandwich, it was all about finding a cut that divides given volumes in two. With the pumpkin, we had the case that taking arbitrary subsets of something and moving them innocently around can lead to volume distorting paradoxes. Then the pizza helped us to take a particular given cut and analyze the resulting pieces. In contrast, 
The pancake only cared about the number of cuts and pieces and not the areas we got. And finally, we had cake cutting algorithms, which showed how cutting and dividing things in the real world can work. There are numerous other ways of how to cut, split and divide things in math, of course, but I hope you enjoyed the selection of examples we looked at here. With that, thank you for watching and until next time.